Okay, so we're on module one, and I just added this page right here. Um, I'll probably, I think I'm just going to even turn off that other one. Uh, this has all the objectives for module one and test one. So um, there are Word documents, so you can download them, save them to your computer as well. Um, you got to do that for your PowerPoints, right? You can't print from Canvas. You got to download it and then print from PowerPoint. And then, as some of you guys learned, right? There's different ways you can print. So you can print more than one slide per page if you want, and even have lines to write notes on. So I, um, I'm not going to download it. When you click it, it'll download it. Um, but I'm going to actually just hit preview, so I can actually view it right in Canvas. But again, you can't. Come on, Panda. So in this one, I actually put the chapter overview in it. Um, but you'll see the first objective we're going to talk about is uh, the definition of the science of microbiology and describe some of the general methods used in microbiology, uh, the study of microbiology, excuse me. We'll describe the different um, cell type morphologies and the classifications as it relates to that. And then you'll notice I kind of indented this one. Um, this is referred to a chart that's in... Uh, that later chapter, I think it's 35. All the rest of this is discussed in uh, chapter 1. And then again, I reiterated, right, on the very first objectives of what the testing format is going to be like. And then, you know, when we get to the next set of objectives, I keep clicking to open it instead of the row preview button. You know, I always suggest to my students that you read over these and, you know, read a little bit in your book, print out the PowerPoints ahead of time, read over them even um, before class. So that way, anything that's not making sense, we can clarify um, in lecture. You'll see the objectives are really short, actually, for Chapter 2. So we'll actually, next week, we'll do Chapter 2 and actually then start um, on the next topic, which is Chapters, I think, 3 and 4. This one's a much longer list hit the right button, right? Oh, there we go. So you'll see there's 13 objectives on that one. So, as I said, much longer list. And then the last one on eukaryotes. But these, you should be able to read them and actually be able to do what it says. You know, be able to define endosymbiotic theory, right? So if I ask you multiple choice question or matching question or, you know, a question with a blank but yet multiple choices underneath it, right? I don't do fill in the blank where you actually have to type it in. I usually do fill in the blank with choices, so it's still kind of multiple choice. Um, and I'm not real heavy on true false. I'm not a big fan. But there's always a, a couple, you know, probably more than 10. 10 would be the maximum on a test for me. And I don't even think I have a test that has that many. Um, but it's one of the requirements for us, right, that we have that testing format, at least some of it. Um, I prefer the multiple choice. Um, and I do have matching as well. Um, and then also some identifications, where you have a picture and you have to match what is labeled in the picture. So, for instance, to be able to identify eukaryotic cell structures in a drawing or micrograph. So then, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn this one off. So there's our objectives. Here's where the recorded lecture from today is going to be posted. And then here's each one of the PowerPoints that go along with the objectives. So we're going to go ahead and start right away on this one. And I can't remember if I've got it saved on this computer, so why not just go ahead and download it, right? <laughs> that way I have the right one. The same one you guys have got.
So our first topic is, of course, microbiology, because this is microbiology course, right? <laughs> so we get to start with our namesake. So microorganisms are very important, right? We actually could not have life on this planet if it was not for microorganisms. They tend to get a bad rap, though, right? Because they can do really bad things, but they do really important things as well, right? Uh, and they are the most abundant, which is very easy considering the fact that they're microscopic, right? They're really tiny, so a whole bunch of them can fit in little tiny niches um, in our bodies, on our bodies, right, and in the environment around us. So they're found everywhere. They play a major role in recycling essential elements, right? So, for instance, nitrogen in the atmosphere is converted into usable forms in the soil by bacteria living in the soil. Uh, that make it readily available for plants, right? And then the plants utilize it, and then the animals, like ourselves, eat the plants, right? And then we put it, when we die, it gets put back into the atmosphere or, or into the soil. How is it recycled back into that place? By microorganisms, right? So they complete that cycle for nitrogen and other major elements that are needed for life on Earth. So we always think of plants when we think of photosynthesis, right? But can microorganisms photosynthesize? Absolutely, right? The algae in our oceans, right, and the cyanobacteria in our oceans are the ones that actually produce the oxygen that make life possible for us that breathe oxygen for aerobic organisms. They produce excess oxygen by photosynthesis. It is not the plants on this planet because they use just as much oxygen as they produce. They don't produce an excess. Cyanobacteria and algae in our oceans do that. They produce several fruit products and beverages that we prefer, right, especially on the weekends, right? Beer, wine, none of those would exist without the fermentation process by microorganisms. Um, yogurt, cheeses, um, lots of different fermented foods, right, are, have those properties from the process of microorganisms fermenting them. Antibiotics are produced by microorganisms. It seems kind of weird, right? When do you take antibiotics? When you're sick with a bacterial infection, right? Huh. But I just told you microorganisms make it. Anyone know of a microorganism that makes an antibiotic, a specific one? Alexander Fleming discovered it, actually. Amoxicillin is a derivative of it. Penicillin. Penicillin. Penicillin is produced by a mold called penicillium. That mold produces this chemical, right? This chemical that we know as penicillin kills gram-positive bacteria. Well, why are these two organisms fighting? Why are bacteria and fungi, this is chemical warfare, y'all. That's what antibiotics are. Why is that fungus killing off that bacteria? What are they fighting over? What do we fight over? Food and resources, place to live, right? It's the same battle that's been going on for eons. When we use antibiotics, we're just stealing the technology and using it for ourselves. That's it. It's really that simple. So there are some bacteria that produce antibiotics that kill other bacteria, too. Right? Um, uh, and lots of molds and yeast fight um, other organisms, other microscopic organisms like bacteria. So I am actually going to be leaving you guys for a week this summer. Um, so you'll probably have to listen to some old recordings, or we may have a substitute teacher, I don't know. We can probably vote on that later and decide what you guys want to do. But for one week, two classes, I'm going to be gone. I'm going to be at UConn um, doing hands-on training uh, to learn how to isolate bacteria and mold um, from soil samples. And the, it's a crowdsourcing initiative. It's actually gone worldwide. And my honors microbiology students next spring 
will, instead of doing an unknown that I know, like where I give them the bacteria, but they don't know what it is, but I know, we will actually do a true unknown. We will go out and get soil samples and isolate bacteria from soil and try to identify it. And the reasoning for that is trying to find new antibiotics. So the, the last antibiotic, and I can't remember the name of it, was discovered actually in Germany by doing just that, isolating bacteria, um, microorganisms from the soil. Um, and that was, the, that was, we hadn't had a new antibiotic in I don't know how many years, a really long time. Um, and as you guys know, if any of you guys seen it, right, what do we have right now? There's a woman in the United States that had a bacterial infection, and guess what? Not a single antibiotic that we have at our disposal does that bacteria affect it by. It's 100% antibiotic resistant for all the known antibiotics we currently have. How terrifying is that? I don't know. I don't know. I just saw I just saw the headline and I read a couple sentences. I haven't had a chance to look into it because I'm moving. Um, but it was literally like this past week. Um, it was posted. Which is pretty impressive because one of my friends who's a teacher but he's not a science teacher was like, did you see <laughs> about that? And I was like, no, I hadn't seen. And like, get home and all my nerdy friends had posted it on Facebook. I love my science friends. <laughs> and I was like, oh my god. This is nuts. I was like, I'm so glad I'm going for this training, right? So that we can become part of this initiative um, to hopefully maybe discover new antibiotics. Um, because it's a war, right, that we're in. And it's they're going to continue to evolve and be resistant to antibiotics. Um, and it, unless we find new ones um, that the organisms who are living in association with them have evolved, um, then we're going to lose that battle. So... Uh, really interesting um, initiative. It's called, um, if you want to look it up, they're on Facebook too. Who isn't, right? Small World Initiative is the name of the initiative. Um, and there's actually a girl, I can't remember what school, she discovered potentially, she's not finished all the testing yet, but a brand new bacteria that we hadn't discovered previously. <laughs> Get this, y'all. It's pink. It's pink. It, the, the organism is literally pink. It's really cool. <laughs> I was like, this is a joke, right? Like, you know, you see that? I was like, oh, this is a joke. No, it's real. <laughs> it's really big. <laughs> so, of course, she's going to probably name it her last name if it's really a new organism. She's named it after herself. So, it's pretty cool stuff. So, but, right, all that coolness, you've got the few bad apples in the barrel, right, that we tend to concentrate on, and that is the pathogenic organisms, the ones that cause disease, like we were just saying, and kill humans and animals, and hence why uh, we usually, when you say microorganisms, most people go, ew, right, or oh no, right, instead of, oh, thank God, right, we wouldn't be able to live without them. So we're going to look at just a select group uh, pathogenic organisms and talk about what specific infectious diseases and you'll need to be able to associate them so this is a really good matching question right where you match up the description of the disease with the organism that causes the disease or the disease itself so this is a table from your book that I've abbreviated right so I've just pulled out the select few that we're going to concentrate on so the disease and the name of the causative agent, and that's what etiological means, what causes that particular disease. So in this case, um, Bacillus anthraxis, which is a bacteria, causes what disease? It's in its name, isn't it? Bacillus anthraxis, anthrax. What's the scary bad thing about this infection? is that the bacteria that causes it can form what's called endospores. These are a resting, dormant state of the bacteria that are extremely resistant to environmental conditions of drying, heating, you name it. Pretty much nothing other than an autoclave with high pressure steam is going to actually destroy an endospore. So these things are just laying in wait. So if you inhale them, which is what happened at one time in 1991 when it went through the mail, the powder 
was millions upon billions of these spores. When individuals inhaled them, then they germinated. They turned back into that original bacteria they once were. The bad news about this is it's a very bad bacteria, right? It can debilitate and kill the organism. So even individuals that got treated still died, right, um, depending on the level of exposure. So this can be really scary. The good news is in the United States is we've done a really good job of cleaning this bacteria up from our environment. So even though like an animal would die, right, and those spores could become part of the environment, we've done a really good job of, for the most part, recognizing this and cleaning up instances of it. So we don't usually have a problem with the United States. It's when things are imported from other countries or when people go to other countries um, that they tend to be at risk. We do have a vaccine for this, although again, most people aren't going to be exposed to it, so it's not a routine vaccine in the United States. But that's also why it could be used as a bioterrorist agent against us, right? Because people are not vaccinated. Same thing with smallpox, right? We used to vaccinate for that. If you know an older individual that has a scar on their upper arm, a circular scar, that's from the smallpox vaccine. Uh, but it had been at one time eradicated from the world. Um, but there have been some pockets that have been discovered and some people who kept it and have done bad things with it. So our military is vaccinated, uh, especially if they're deployed, against smallpox now. So you'll even have some younger people that will have that characteristic smallpox scar um, to help protect them uh, uh, in war so it can't be used against them. Um, direct contact with the bacteria um, can also um, get, get, you can also get anthrax. Smallpox, on the other hand, is a viral infection. It's a virus. So a lot of animals other than humans can carry anthrax, right? And as I said, for the most part, we've done a really good job of cleaning it up in the United States. Um, so there isn't a strong risk of exposure. The next one is Brucicella uh, melanitensis. Um, this disease is known as brucellosis, or sometimes undulant fever, because it'll, in humans it'll cause um, periods of high fever, and then you get a uh, period where you don't, and then you get fever back. So it goes through this cyclic fever um, um, manifestation. At one time, this can be found in several animals, right? So it's very common in cattle, um, goats, swine, sheep, horses, mules, dogs, cats, fowl, deer, rabbits. Um, so we had lots of different species names for this. So Bruce's Brucicella melanitensis was the name actually for what we thought was a, sp a specific species for goats. Brucicella uh, abortus was the name for cattle, and as that implies, um, it actually causes abortion in cattle. Right? If the female is infected with this infection, she will ab uh, abort her fetus. Which, of course, for cattle ranchers, that means that you don't have a next generation. Um, and so it can debilitate it's very easily spread by direct contact, and the female would also produce it in her milk. Um, and so um, it could wipe out an entire cattle herd. So they vaccinate cattle against this um, bacterial infection. And it's really a big deal uh, for cattle ranchers to be brucellosis free. So much so that the bison, not listed here, in Yellowstone National Park, they also can get brucellosis. Um, so they have a vaccination program that they've implemented for the bison in Yellowstone National Park. Part of the reason for that, too, is that when the bison, if they escape the park and they go to nearby cattle ranchers, the cattle ranchers will shoot them on site for fear they may be carrying the disease and could carry it to their herd. All right? They don't want to risk the spread. Suis was the name for a swine, but as, we, as we've advanced in our genetic testing, we found out that all the Brucicella are all the same species. So they've kind of settled on um, Brucicella melanitensis, the one that was typically for Brucicella and goats. But sometimes you'll still see these other genus names used. But the pretty much agreed upon genus name is melanitensis for Brucis, Brucilloas, Brucilloas. 
This one also is listed as a bioterrorist agent on the second level. And the reason for this is, uh, unlike cattle, it doesn't cause abortion in, in um, humans, but it can cause a pretty serious infection. But it isn't the fear of the infection in humans that puts it on the risk level for us. It's the fear that they could disseminate it to our cattle, which is a major food source for people in the United States. Right? We eat a lot of beef. A lot. So much so that my Asian friends have informed me that Americans smell like beef. Right? We smell like what we eat. They smell like Asian spices, but, you know, right? Because that's what they eat. Right? You really are what you eat. So therefore, I no longer eat gluten because it does not like me. <laughs> At all. And it, it's amazing. Last summer, I found out I was gluten intolerant. And I cut it out of my diet and completely changed my life. I wasn't sleeping. I had a sleep apnea machine. I was just miserable. Uh, I couldn't breathe through my nose most of the time. And it was because it was exacerbating um, inflammation. I have allergies, but eating the gluten was making it even worse for me and the grains and such as that. So it was hard to cut it out, but I also didn't realize I was getting really bad headaches from it. So when I cut it out and then I tried to add it back in, <laughs> it was like my dentist the other day. He's like, don't go and eat cold pizza. I got a new crown in, right? He's like, don't go eat some cold pizza. And the assistant is going, Erica doesn't stray from her diet. <laughs> She's not going to be eating that cold pizza unless you found some gluten-free crust. She ain't touching it. <laughs> it's not worth the headache. I ate two bites of a cinnamon roll around Mardi Gras. Two. Two. The worst headache imaginable. The worst. Never do that again. Never. So, yep. You know, you got to find what makes your body happy. For me, whole lots of fruits and vegetables. And I still like beef, too. Well, you're supposed to kind of not eat so much of that. Right. But, yeah, it would, it would really, you know, debilitate our, one of our major food sources in the United States if someone was to disseminate that, right, to cattle ranchers. And I think it very easily, you know, contaminate the feed. Um, so at LSU, they do have a research division um, that works on this um, bacteria. And because it's a bioterrorist agent, um, you have to go through a six-month pretty extensive background check to be able to work in this research lab at LSU Vet School. Um, Bordetella hensi. Um, this one is known as cat scratch disease. Um, and I usually talk about this one for my vet tech majors and stuff like that. Um, and it, this is interesting, though, because dogs carry it too, but cats are the most common ones that carry it that actually pass it to humans. And it's what's typically called a zoonotic disease. It's not common in humans, but it's very common in animals, and it's only usually accidentally passed to us. So the reason why it's called cat scratch, because cats tend to what? Scratch you. So then you have a wound, and the wound can get infected either from their saliva or from the flea feces that's on the cat because the, the bacteria is actually spread from cat to cat by fleas. So the type of cats that you want to avoid to avoid this bacterial infection are stray feral cats, right, that typically will have fleas because no one's taking care of them. And so they most often will have this bacterial infection. Feral cats, actually, believe it or not, are not friendly. If you try to pick them up, they'll usually scratch you, right? Um, and then they could possibly pass on this infection to you. Um, typically, it'll manifest by having swollen lymph nodes in the area um, near the scratch. A lot of times, a person over several months will be able to get the infection under control. But, of course, you, it's better if you just go get antibiotics. Uh, and this one is sensitive to things as simple as penicillin currently. Um, and you can clear up the, the infection. But you'll get swollen lymph nodes, especially like if it's on your arm, you'll get swollen lymph nodes in your armpit region. And um, one of the professors here recently, she has a cat that she lets go out. And um, she had swollen lymph nodes in her um, armpit region. And when she went for her mammogram, they were all freaking out and they wanted her to go for a biopsy. And we were talking about it. I was like, did they check to see if you have um, cat scratch? 
And she's like, no. And I was like, well, I'd go do a course of antibiotics before I go for a biopsy, right? Why do an invasive procedure when you might have an infection that you can clearly get rid of with antibiotics? So she went and did. I haven't talked to her since then. Um, but I didn't hear about her going for a biopsy, so we probably figured out what it was. She's a doctor herself, so <laughs> she's an MD. So we were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go see about this before we go and poke a hole in our boot. Right? It's not fun. I've been through it. Last January, I thought it would be good. And my New Year's resolution was take better care of me, so I went for all my checkups. And they're like, oh, you know, we want to do a biopsy. Explain to me again why I was being good. Because my 35-year-old sister had breast cancer three years ago. That's why. But I don't. I still got them. They're little, but, you know, I still got them. <laughs> I'll hold on to them for a little bit longer. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. So encephalitis, right? These can be kind of scary. These are caused by viruses, as it says in its name, right? Abroviruses, because they tend to be transmitted by mosquitoes, right? These um, arthropod biting insects that we're not so fond of, right? Um, the they had St. Louis in the book, um, but the one that we worry the most about here, do you guys know why they track the mosquitoes and what they're testing for? West Nile. Yeah, they're looking for West Nile. Um, and again, birds are the common carriers for that as well. Um, for the Encephalo melantensis um, and the equine um, infections, mostly horses, hence the equine in the names, um, but also other animals. And again, the problem is, is these groups of viruses are transmitted by the bite of a mosquito. Some of them, it, you just feel like you have the flu, right? A normal kind of viral infection. Some of them can progress to involving the brain, and that's when it gets really scary, right? And that's why we want to try to protect ourselves um, so that we don't get that type of infection. And with viruses, you're really dependent on your immune system taking care of it. We have very few antiviral drugs out there um, that are effective against viruses. So Giardia instantalis, so causes um, Giardias. Rodents, deer, cattle, dogs, cats are the most common carriers. Um, and the most common way you would come in contact with this microorganism is through water that's been contaminated by their feces. This one's not a bacteria. Anyone know what type of microorganism Giardia is? It was actually discovered by Anthony von Leeuwenhoek um, because he was a very curious individual and he even looked at his own poop. Uh, and it's not uncommon for humans to also have this type of infection um, and not even know it. So it's not a bacteria, right? Anybody know of other types of microscopic organisms that we study in microbiology? A parasite? Protus. Yep. This one's a protozoa. This one's a protozoa. And we would look at it in microbiology lab, but I have not been able to obtain good slides. And of course, this is a pathogen, so we're not working with live cultures with this one. Uh, but they're kind of cute. They look like little teardrops, and they have paired nuclei, so it looks like they have little eyes, but they don't. And they're single-celled microscopic organisms in the classification of protozoa. And they've got like eight flagella, so they swim around. Pulmonary uh, syndrome uh, caused by hantavirus, known as hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. And uh, so at one time, they didn't know what caused this um, pulmonary problem. And um, that's why it's referred to as a syndrome, because it was a list of symptoms, right, that they were dealing with that had a pulmonary um, effect. So what do we mean when we say pulmonary? What part of the body? Lungs. Lungs. Referring to your lungs. So again, another one where it's a virus, 
right? So again, very little we can do for you, usually just supportive, try and keep you alive while your immune system takes care of the invader. Deer mice are the main carriers of this virus. They shed it in their feces and their urine. If you come in contact with their saliva, their urine, or their feces, right, this can also become aerosolized, right, as their stuff gets into the environment. The good news is living here in, in Louisiana, it's not endemic, right? The, the mice populations don't have this viral infection. In more arid regions like Arizona, New Mexico, um, Nevada, they do have it. Um, and they've had outbreaks. The scary thing too is though, like if they don't, if warehouses that hold like canned goods and stuff like that, if they don't have proper rodent control, those things could be running across the tops of your cans and peeing and pooping on them. And you wouldn't really know it. So it's always advised that the canned foods that you eat, that you wash the top of the can before you open it um, to help avoid this type of infection. Um, if you're gonna cook the food, that will actually kill it. But if it's like canned peaches um, that you're just gonna eat out of the can, wash the top of the can before you open it. Just to be on the safe side, because you don't know where that can came from, right? Where it was stored. Borrelia burgdorferi. This is transmitted by ticks. And this isn't really a common one here, again, in Louisiana, because our ticks aren't infected with this bacteria. Does anybody know what this infection is? Lyme disease. Good. It's named after Lyme, Connecticut, which is where it was discovered, and where it's pre predominant in the United States right now, um, in the New England region of the United States, but also around the Great Lakes, and it's spreading. Why is it spreading? Why are we seeing Lyme disease moving? So it's ticks, mainly um, deer ticks, actually, that transmit this. So why is the infection moving? What's moving? The deer, right, and their ticks with the bacteria. So why are the deer moving? This is why, yeah, this is why nature preserves are very important, not only for the animals, but for us, right? So they have a place to live, and they don't encroach upon us. The problem is, is we've encroached upon them. That's why they're moving, right? Encroachment upon their habitats. So this is a pretty serious disease in New England, where I'm originally from, because my mom, the Southern Belle, during the Vietnam War, married a damn Yankee. That was my dad. So I grew up in Massachusetts until I was old enough to run away. All the way south to Louisiana. <laughs> I probably went as far as you can go. <laughs> it does never, well, it almost never snows here. That's a plus. It's cold there. I was frozen for the first 20 years of my life. How old do you think I am? Definitely 20, because I was frozen for 20 years. I was cryopreserved. Because when I tell you how old I really am, you probably won't believe me. Well, you got to guess first. Yeah, yeah. Be realistic. 30? 35? 42. Yeah, my son thinks I'm 55. I did that kid questionnaire that was going around Facebook last week. I was like, how old is your mom? Uh, 55. <laughs> All my friends are like, man, you look good for 55. I said, yeah, I know. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I was frozen. Literally frozen. So they even vaccinate back home their companion animals, um, cats and dogs against Lyme disease because it's so prevalent um, in that area. Um, not really a problem here, um, but you know that's one of the things you have to take into consideration when you travel, right? Um, I've had friends that have gone and um, worked in different regions and have come back with the disease. And then the doctors here are like, don't know what to do. And you have to almost self-diagnose, 
you know, my friend is like, I've got the bullseye, right? You get this characteristic rash because this is a, this organism's a spirochete. It swims, it corkscrews through your tissue. So where it was introduced into the bite wound, then it spreads out in a circular manner. And the immune system it responds until you get this rash, but you get this rash pattern of several circles. Sometimes, not always. But that's very characteristic of Lyme disease. So if you see a bullseye type rash, it's a pretty strong indicator it's Lyme disease. Again, we have antibiotics that are effective against it, but you want to catch it early because it can cause damage to joints that we can't repair. Right? Um, so if it spreads too extensively, we could kill it and it could be gone, but then you've got to deal with the after effects for the rest of your life. I have a friend that was in college and she wasn't diagnosed early. And although she doesn't have the bacterial infection anymore, she suffers severe joint pain because of the infection. Uh, Uracenia pesticis. Anyone know what infection that is? And it still happens. There's still about 100 cases in the United States each year. But most people thought it was, you know, something in medieval times that we don't see it anymore. The plague, yeah, the plague. And it is a bacteria, again. Uh, and the scary thing with this one um, is pneumonic plague, right, where it's an infection in the lungs and it's spread respiratorily. But the plague itself typically is an infection of the lymphatic system, which is your system that drains the fluid from your body and recirculates it when you have infection and inflammation in your tissues, when you have that fluid leaking out of your blood. Um, it gets filtered through your lymphatic system. So this gets into that system and infects that system. And so they would get these bobbles, these bumps, and um, it's spread by fleas. Right? This bacterial infection is, fed, is, is spread by fleas. So I guess, again, contact with the animals that typically would have these fleas, domestic rats, wild rodents, and such. And so it was a problem when we had unsanitary living conditions, right? When people were living um, amongst rats and mice and, and things like that. The good news, again, is that this particular bacteria is not very common um, in Louisiana. This is a problem in other places, especially in arid regions like Arizona, New Mexico, um, Nevada. But the best way to help prevent this is to avoid the animals and their fleas. But even in uh, under certain times, like fleas that will live on people and pass it from person to person in the household was a problem. And it can become aerosolized, right? So like never ever do a house clean out, right? Um, where there's been rodents because, you know, there, not only this, these infections, but other infections um, and these bacteria and these viruses can stay in that fecal, even if the mice are gone, if you're cleaning up their nests, right, their poop and their pee, you can aerosolize that and inhale it and get an infection from it. So you always want to do that in a very safe manner. Either hire a professional or make sure you have um, proper protection. You don't inhale that stuff when you're cleaning it up. I know they've had, had people that were getting really sick that were doing these house cleanouts after Katrina. The next one, uh, the bite of a rabbit animal. So that's rabies. What type of organism causes that infection? What type of microscopic organism? Or some people would say it's not even an organism. Is it, it's not a, is it a bacterial infection? Virus. It's a virus. It's a virus. And again, that's what's really scary about it, right, is we don't have much protection as, in the way of drugs against viruses. And in fact, with rabies, we don't even know if like the vaccine or the treatments that we've tried is actually what saved the person or it was their immune system. Because so few people in history have actually gotten rabies and survived. Right. Uh, so I don't think any of us want to sign up, though, for trials to figure out what works, right? Yep, no, nope, we're just going to all about avoiding it, right? And most of us know what to avoid. So on this list, what's the number one suspect? Um, dogs, bats, possums, skunks, raccoons, foxes, cattle, or cats in Louisiana? Raccoons are number one, and I've been recently told possums are number two. These are nocturnal animals, right, which means they come out at night. 
So if they're wandering around during the day, you run in the other direction and you call animal control, right? Because that's not normal behavior for them. Uh, they're, well, I don't know about the possums, but raccoons are kind of cute. Again, don't mess with them. At LSU Vet School, you, they bring them in, kill them immediately and op autopsy them to see if they have rabies. 90% of them do. Vaccinate your companion animals. And Louisiana finally went to the three-year vaccine, right? You don't have to vaccinate your animal every year anymore for rabies, um, but make sure you do it every three years. So how do we get these communicable diseases, right, these infectious diseases? You can come in contact with them, what we refer to as indirectly, right? You could touch something that's been contaminated with it, or you can ingest something like food or water that's been contaminated, or other biological products. So what comes out of our bodies that we typically want to avoid because it may contain microorganisms that are infectious? Feces, blood, saliva, urine, believe it or not, most of the time is sterile unless someone does have an infection, and in that case you could get an infection from that. One more. Vomit, yep. So still one more. Yeah, tears, not so much. Well, if you have um, conjunctivitis, so yeah. Mucus, someone spits, that's disgusting. Leave it in your body, please. It's the most annoying thing I ever see in the world. I actually yell at people because I'm crazy like that. You're not supposed to spit. Swallow it. You can. Trust me, you can. If you cannot spit it somewhere where someone else will not be exposed to it. <laughs> right? Because we don't know what's in that. My husband's lucky I even kiss him. Right? When he's sick, no. We don't even sleep in the same bed. Mostly he avoids me when I'm sick. He doesn't want to get sick. <laughs> One more, guys. Or our one guy, semen, right? Sexually transmitted diseases can be transmitted by semen. And this is why for some religions even, like Jehovah Witnesses, right, they won't take blood transfusions because you are at risk when you take a blood transfusion. You could get a particular disease. Because at one time, we didn't know about HIV, right? People actually got HIV from blood transfusions, right? Hemophiliacs. Um, one of my sister's friends died from HIV that progressed to AIDS because of a blood transfusion, because he was a hemophiliac. So there was a time where we didn't know about it, couldn't test for it. So is there a possibility that there's something in blood that we can't test for right now that could kill you? Absolutely. So you got to kind of agree with them on that. But usually doctors are only going to give you blood transfusion when you really need those blood cells, right? So you're really kind of like, OK, do I want to risk a disease or do I want to die? I don't know. I usually choose life. Life with a disease as opposed to no life. I don't know. But that's why, you know, certain beliefs like that, they actually have a scientific root at them for some things. Why Jewish don't eat pork, right? Um, because, you know, of the parasites that are, are commonly found in pork until they knew how to properly take care of that meat so you didn't get that infection, they just avoided it altogether. You know, and that was the basis of it. You know, that was to protect that community, which make, makes sense. But we now know, you know, why it was bad, right? So my Jewish friends, most of them, they eat ham. Because <laughs> they understand, right, there was a reason for it at that time. There really isn't a reason to not eat ham anymore. Things can become airborne. Right, um, the dust in the air, right, which for the most part in your home is usually epithelial cells from your own skin, which is what the dust mites eat, uh, but also dirt and debris. My house has got a whole lot of that, as well as pet hair. My dog's, my husband's dog. You just touch her and it's like a snowstorm, <laughs> right? It's like hair everywhere right now. It's like poof, right? So. Um, those things can, of course, have microorganisms attached to them. So right now, as we're sitting here, we're actually breathing in microorganisms. The good news is that our nose is actually designed to filter those out, right? And we have mucus to trap them. 
and we send them down our throat to our stomach, which contains hydrochloric acid, which is really good at killing 99.9% .9 of the microorganisms you inhale on a daily basis. And you don't get any infection. It's also why you're, it, it is designed to breathe through your nose, because your nose has the hairs and the mucus um, that help in that filtering. You can, of course, breathe through your mouth, but there is a reason why you have a nose. And it also helps humidify, which is moisturize the air for, to make breathing um, possible, and it warms it so that's at the correct temperature. And that's why people that go climb crazy things like Everest, you know, can run into difficulties because um, there's not enough moisture and not enough warmth to the air to be able to effectively breathe. That, and there's a whole lot less hair up there, too. I don't know those crazy people that try to do that without oxygen. Yeah. You go, you go. I'm good. It doesn't snow here. <laughs> it's not cold. <laughs> it's definitely humid though, right? We don't have that problem. Yesterday was like trying to breathe through a wet rag. <laughs> it's horrible. Uh, so we know, right, kissing because you'd be swapping spit. That's what kissing is, kind of, right? Sex because of the seminal fluid and the fluids involved with that. That um, direct contact, referring to as horizontal contact, can happen. Airborne droplets, right, from People's um, mucus in their mouth, their saliva, can contain microorganisms. So you always want to keep about a three-foot distance between you and someone else. Um, all of us have experienced this, right? What we call face talkers. People like to talk literally in your face. Don't try backing up because they just keep coming. This is what you do. You put your arms up. That stops them, right? And it keeps them out of your zone, right? This is your safe zone. You're allowed to have your zone. You just put your hands up, right? Barracks in military were actually designed to be three to four feet away from each other so you don't have that cross-contamination happening between the monk beds when people are sick. Vertical transmission can only happen for women because we're the only ones that give birth currently. You know, I don't think guys really want to change that, but crazy scientists are trying to change that. Um, but because of that connection, that intimate connection of another organism growing inside of you, uh, unfortunately, um, infections that you have can pass uh, through the placenta and damage the baby. And then good old vectors, right? We know all about those, right? Um, the most common one we worry about here in Louisiana is good old mosquitoes. But don't forget about the fleas that we talked about, right? The ticks. All those other lovely biting things, mites. They could be carrying infectious disease. So most of us are aware of this, right, and know how to avoid these types of contacts um, as best we can. But it still happens, right, because you're sick before you know you're sick, so you're out spreading infection, right, a lot of times, and that's why these infections persist. So if we were to define microbiology, right, what would you say? Well, it's an ology, so we're studying, right? What are we studying? Right, of microorganisms. And micro means what? Small. So much so the tool that most microbiologists use is a what? A microscope, right? Because you can't, for the most part, for most of these organisms, you cannot see them with the naked eye. Individual organisms, right? You can only see them when they're large numbers. You're not looking at individual cells without using a microscope. None of these guys are too tiny. And so again, biology is typically the study of living organisms, right? But in microbiology, we do tend to study viruses um, because they are they're actually sub-microscopic. Um, you have to use very high-powered electron microscopes and the, the more advanced microscopes that um, previous scientists didn't have access to. You're not going to go into microbiology lab and pull out a light microscope and look at a virus. They're too small. <laughs> right? You're not going to see them. Um, and most scientists, like myself, don't consider them living entities. Um, but because they are microscopic, or sub-microscopic even, um, they are put under the discipline of microbiology. And then also a lot of the general methods that we use to study microbiology. Um, so, although other scientists use our techniques, um, therefore they're sometimes referred to as microbiologists, um, but they are probably studying 
subdisciplines of microbiology, like genetics, right? So they use bacteria in the study of DNA and RNA. Um, and so these abilities to work with microorganisms have advanced our scientific base and knowledge and, and the different things that we can look at. So for instance, for my master's degree, when I was at Southeastern, um, I, I, my, my sub-discipline is immunology, but my primary was molecular biology. So I studied biology at the molecular level, so at the DNA level. Um, but, and I used microbiological techniques to do that, right? And um, I studied the effects um, that pollution had on the immune system of frogs in Bayou Trepanier, right? So what effect being exposed to those chemicals that Shell Company just dumped into the bayou before regulations were going on, what effect does it have, do those chemicals have on the immune system of frogs in that ecosystem? And as you can imagine, it was not good. So we generally define it as a study of organisms too small to be seen clearly by the unaided eye, i.e. microorganisms. But also we take into account the techniques used to study these organisms. So they're, they tend to be relatively simple in their construction and lack highly differentiated cells and distinct tissues. But there are some pretty amazing microorganisms out there. Uh, rotifers, for example, are uh, really tiny microscopic organisms. They are so unique. They have their own phylum classification. Uh, you can see their little digestive tract when you look at them under the microscope. And they have uh, these little disks that spin around with cilia that help them bring food into their system. They live in the water. Uh, you'll see them swimming around if you take a sample of pond water. Sometimes you might catch one of those guys. They're pretty cool. And in that case, they actually have distinct tissues. That tiny, and yet they have distinct tissues. But that's, that's very rare. They're very unique. Um, most of the microorganisms we look at are, you know, they're, they don't have, most of them are single-celled organisms, so we can't even talk about tissues, right? We can't talk about multiple cells working together um, in conjunction to perform its particular function. So this is a website that um, some students of mine um, turned me on to several years in the past. It's one of my favorite ones. Um, Utah Genetics Department put this together. And hopefully my link is working. We'll soon find out. There we go. So what they have done, and I love this too, they have the different measurements, right? So in microbiology, we talk a lot about micrometers, right? which are a millionth of a meter, right? Um, nanometers, which are one billionth of a meter, right? So really small measurements. Uh, I've never dealt with angstroms or picometers, but um, some scientists that study things like viruses were talking about those really small um, measurements. So you can see a comparison here in size of a coffee bean to a grain of rice to a sesame seed. And as you move your bar across, we can zoom in. Right? So we go in even smaller now to, say, a grain of salt, which is about 0.5 millimeters. Right? Half of a millimeter, what you can see on a millimeter ruler. Then, of course, we're definitely using a microscope even to see this. And then even more so to see protozoa like amoeba or paramecium, some of my favorite protozoa. The human egg, which is the largest cell in a woman's body. And then, of course, the little spermy guy who's after her. Skin cell, red blood cell, right? The X chromosome when it's condensed. Baker's yeast, right? This is a, a fungus, fungi. And then you get down to mitochondria, which are inside eukaryotic cells, like our cells, right? They're even larger than a bacteria because there's a belief at one time that a mitochondria actually was a free-living prokaryote that was engulfed by uh, an early eukaryote, and they began this symbiotic relationship, so much so that the mitochondria 
did certain processes, right? It's the energy houses in our cells for our cells, so much so that the cell can't live without the mitochondria, and the mitochondria cannot live without the cells anymore. Uh, your mitochondria you get from your mom that's in that egg, and that's why the egg is so huge. It has all the organelles necessary. Uh, sperm are mobile DNA, period. Right? They're DNA on a mission. They got a couple mitochondria, but most of those don't become part of the egg, right? Um, but is that that other half of DNA that makes the whole um, organism for eukaryotes? So your mitochondria you get from your mom, which can be kind of sometimes bad news, right? Because if mom's mitochondria are defective, so are yours. And that was one of the things for one of my friends in, uh, when I was an undergrad. He was going blind. And it was because he got defective mitochondria from his mom. And because of that, um, and for some reason it tended to progress in males more so than females, but it doesn't have anything to do with that because, again, his sister got the same mitochondria from her mom, but she wasn't going blind. But she also made the choice not to have children. Right, because those defective mitochondria she was going to pass on to her children. And her children could potentially go blind later in life. He was about in his 30s. He was going blind. Because uh, his mitochondria, you, 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 your eyes, man, do they use a lot of energy. It's like insane. And, and they just, I guess they just get burnt out. Because um, they just couldn't keep up. So she has cats. She didn't want to have to deal with the potential of her children going blind. Um, but yeah, so your, your mitochondria, you know, some of that information, though, is also stored in the nucleus. So the mitochondria can't survive without the cell itself. And you get your, yours from your mom. So you can thank her or hate her, depending, right? And then lysosomes, and then we zoom in, and, and poor little E. coli, he's, he's smaller than even your mitochondria. And then we go even smaller for viruses. And then other complex molecules that are found in our cells, like ribosomes that make proteins. They're made out of protein and ribosomal RNA. My favorite proteins in the whole wide world, antibodies, because they're pretty awesome. Hemoglobin, kind of important. And we can get even smaller, down to things like glucose and water. And the root of it all, if you're a living organism, is carbon. Right? The main building block of all our, our molecules, our organic molecules, our proteins, those amino acids that make up those proteins, your sugars, your lipids, your fats, all of this has carbon at the very center of it as its main building platform. So that's why we say carbon-based life forms. It's also why we can do what to determine how old something is? Carbon dating. Because we know the decay rate of these atoms when the organism has died. So we can guesstimate about how long ago it was once living depending on the decay rate of that atom. Now, there could there be life somewhere else in the universe that isn't carbon-based? Sure, we just haven't found it yet. And certainly not on Earth. Anything living is carbon-based. All right, so when it comes to cells, we've kind of alluded to this a little bit already. We have two major classifications that we have for cells, what we call prokaryotic and eukaryotic. And these are defined by their morphology. In our classification system, when we group and classify organisms, you may have learned kingdoms, phylums, right, classes, orders, families. I can never remember them all in order. So I still remember the saying I was taught when I was in grade school, which was, Kevin, please close our front gate slowly. Right? So K for kingdom. Kevin, please. P for phylum. Right? And then it goes on down. But we got to change the sentence a little bit because we have domains now, and they actually go above kingdoms. So I just say, damn, Kevin, close the front gate slowly. Because domains is above kingdoms. And the three recognized domains that we talk about are archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. And so we'll talk about 
what cell types, right? Do we have prokaryotes or are they eukaryotes for bacteria, archaea, and eukarya? So let's first define the different cell types. First are prokaryotes. Pro meaning before. Karyote actually refers to kernel. So when they looked at eukaryote cells, which means true karyote, true kernel, they saw this structure on the inside of these cells that we know today as a nucleus. Right? This compartmentalization of what? What molecules are found inside the nucleus of the eukaryotic cell? Nucleic acids. Give me an example of a nucleic acid. DNA. RNA. Right. Right. DNA and RNA are your nucleic acids, right? Which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, right? Or ribonucleic acid. And proteins are also associated inside that. And that's the Capan Center, that's the information, right? All cells have DNA. The difference is eukaryotes encase it in two membranes called an envelope. Right. They, have a, they have a distinct command center. Where prokaryotes, of course the belief is they came before eukaryotes, they don't have this membrane delineated nucleus. This does not mean they don't have DNA. It just means that they don't compartmentalize it. They also don't have mitochondria or any other membrane organelles that you see in eukaryotes. Eukaryotes, for the most part, are a little bit more complex. Because of that compartmentalization, we say they're more complex. Um, and they tend to be larger. But again, there's always exceptions to the rules, right? There are some prokaryotes out there that are pretty big and some eukaryotes that are really tiny. So the old five kingdom system that isn't quite used so much anymore was Monera, Protista, Fungi, Animalia, and Plantae. Microorganisms fell into the classification of Monera, Protista, and Fungi because uh, fungi is our molds and our yeast, right, which are microscopic, but also much larger ones that create much larger fruiting bodies that we know as mushrooms are in the fungi classification. Protista are things like protozoa and um, algae. And Monera is uh, the classification that most bacteria fell under. But we came up with the three domain alternative when uh, Carl Woese started studying ribosomal RNA. And all ribosomes contain ribosomal RNA and protein, and they make proteins. All living cells have to have ribosomes. So prokaryotes and eukaryotes have ribosomes. And so he was able to look at this sequence and compare them. And when he did this, he saw three distinct groups. One we named bacteria, one named archaea, and the other one named eukarya. All right, so this is the tree that he was able to put together based on the relationships, the similarities in that RNA sequence that he saw for ribosomes. So Carl Woese came up with this in the 1970s. And it wasn't until probably the early to late 90s that it actually was widely accepted by the scientific community, this new classification, and it actually made it into your textbooks. So when I was in school, I didn't learn this. Well, I should say, when I was in my younger years, I learned it in grad school, though. <laughs> When I was in these seats, we didn't talk about domains. Uh, so where are we, right? Uh, eukarya, as you can guess, right, are eukaryotic organisms. They all contain eukaryotic cells. They all have a nucleus. So you'll see our grouping right here, because what is the genus name for us? Homo sapiens, right, is, this homo, is the genus and species. And then in the bacteria, let's see, there's Ericea. Most of us know good old E. coli, right? Um, and then the Archaea, these are some really weird ones you've probably never heard of. Look at this one, marine low temperature. So these are ones found in marine environments under low temperatures. They didn't even get a genus name <laughs> yet. These have letters and numbers even. 
So I'm a big fan of tables. Most scientists are. It's a very good, easy way to organize information and be able to quickly compare and contrast it. So when we say cell type, we're saying prokaryotic or eukaryotic. So for bacteria, what do you guys think? Prokaryotes or eukaryotes? They're prokaryotic. What about archaea? They're also prokaryotic. Eukarya, as the name implies, are all eukaryotes. That one's easy, right? Cell organization. And what this means is, is it a single cell, what we call unicellular, or is that that's it, that's the organism? Or is it multicellular like us? So what are bacteria? Are they unicellular or multicellular? They're unicellular. A single cell is a single organism for bacteria. And that's true for all prokaryotes. So therefore, archaea are also unicellular. Eukarya, as we know, though, can be what? Multi, but can they be unicellular? Yeah, protozoa, right? Like the Giardia. They are unicellular, single-celled organisms. So it could be one or the other. Cell walls containing peptidoglycan. This is a defining characteristic of a single domain. Did anybody know which organisms contain peptidoglycan in their cell walls? True bacteria, yes. Bacteria do. This does not mean that archaea do not have cell walls. They just don't have ones made out of peptidoglycan. Do eukarya, do some of them have cell walls? Yeah, because plants fall into this classification, right? Algae fall into this classification. They have cell walls, right? But they're made of cellulose, not peptidoglycan. So the answer here is no. Membrane-bound organelles. This is a characteristic of what cell type? Eukaryotic. So do bacteria have it? Nope. Archaea? Nope. Eukarya? Absolutely. Where can you find bacteria on this planet? Yeah, you name it, it's there. All environments. What about archaea? Yeah, you will find them just about everywhere, but you will find them in extreme environments. These guys like the really hot, the really cold, the really salty, right? They've evolved for these types of environments. You can find them in other environments, but they tend to be more numerous in the extreme environments. Where are you going to find eukarya? Are you going to find them everywhere? No. I mean, if they're anything like me, forget about Antarctica, right? Ain't happening. Right? Are they going to be living in the hydrothermal vents in the ocean? No, that's going to be your archaea. So anywhere that's not considered extreme, right, is where you're going to find uh, eukarya. We just haven't adapted to the craziness. So animals, plants, and eukaryotic organisms, these are all in the domain eukarya. But of course, this is microbiology class, right? We're still going to talk about humans because, you know, we're like that. We can't stop talking about ourselves, right? But we'll focus on protists, um, unicellular algae, protozoa, slime molds, water molds, and fungi. Um, most are larger than eukaryotes. Um, but again, there's always exceptions. So if we were to look at microbiology in general, right, if we're talking about cellular, right, organized to the cell level, whether it be prokaryotic or eukaryotic, we're going to talk about things like fungi, molds, and yeasts. We're going to talk about protists, algae, protozoa, slime molds, bacteria, things like E. coli, archaea, your methiogenes. A cellular, which means it's not a cell, right? So th these things contain things like DNA and proteins and things like that, but they're not organized to the cellular level. So most of, most of us are aware of viruses, and viruses contain some type of nucleic acid, whether it be DNA or RNA, and have a protein coat at the very least. Viroids, on the other hand, are RNA only. Satellites are a nucleic acid, often RNA. Purons or pyrons or prions are 
composed of just protein. Sometimes they're also just referred to as infectious proteins. So why aren't viruses, viceroid satellites, and purines included in the three domain system? Why didn't I say, oh, they're domain supernatural? Why don't we put them in the classification system like we do fungi and protists and bacteria and archaea? Ah, they're not a cell, right? So we classify living organisms, cellular organisms, different than we do non-cellular organisms. Not to say viruses aren't given genus and species names, but they don't have the same classification as living organisms. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. Um, One last slide. So again, they're acellular, for instance, viruses. And again, about 10,000 times smaller than your typical bacteria. These guys are teeny tiny. But they cause numerous diseases, as we know, and even been linked to some cancers. So again, why microbiologists study them? And specifically, microbiologists who study them are commonly referred to as virologists, right? Who particularly study just viruses. And if any of you guys had Marion Friedstadt, any of you guys know Marion? She teaches some of the biology classes here. Um, she, her background is virology, and uh, she studied the, uh, continues actually to study the polio virus. So she's pretty cool to talk to when it comes to viruses. My knowledge on viruses is about the limit of your textbook. It's not my area of specialty. It's very fascinating. I haven't had time. You know, I wish I could, if I was independently wealthy, I'd just go to school for the rest of my life, but I'm not. I chose to be a teacher, so I'm independently not, never going to be wealthy. Okay, I get pride in my students, though, instead. So we're going to end here. Next time we're going to talk about the cool people who came before us that made all this possible and the different theories they believed in. So have a fun, safe weekend. Stay dry. Pray I stay dry. <laughs>